Do you ever play the game I Spy? Well, let's try that. In this picture, how many forms of nonverbal communication do you spy? I'll bet you there's more than you might think. We express ourselves nonverbally in a variety of different ways. Even just in this picture, there are, there are probably a dozen different forms and channels of nonverbal communication happening. So it's important for us to understand all those different channels. So in this video, we're going to take a look at the different types of nonverbal channels that we use to communicate. So let's start with our body movement, our kinesics, what we call kinesics. There are a variety of different body movements that we use to send messages. Now remember when we communicate non-verbally, these messages are primarily relational. So they have to do with how we feel about uh, that message uh, or the person or, or things like that. They're not necessarily communicating facts. They're communicating uh, relational cues, but we do so in a variety of ways using our body movement. So starting with our facial displays, facial displays are one of the primary forms of nonverbal communication. We express ourselves uh, in a variety of different ways with our facial expressions, right? And we, as receivers, look to other people's facial displays for cues about their um, feelings about that message and and how they're uh, what they're expressing behind the content right so we're very expressive with our facial displays and uh, need to be aware of that as a nonverbal channel our eye behaviors are another one uh, now bear in mind that this could vary from culture to culture what is appropriate or, or what does that eye behavior mean is going to vary from culture to culture but we pay attention to where people are looking when we're speaking to them whether they're making direct eye contact with us and then interpreting what does that mean we, we read into a lot of different things are they being truthful or not truthful and things like that, all based on their eye behaviors or what we call oculesics so another body movement that we use to communicate non-verbally is posture. Are we standing up straight? Are we slouching? Are we turned away from somebody? You know, just our general posture sends a message about um, how we feel about that message, how we feel about that person, how we feel about being in that conversation, all these different relational cues. And then finally, our gestures. How are we using our hands and, and, uh, and, and gesturing and things like that? And again, this is something that's very uh, not just cultural but also independent to that person subjective to that person some people talk with their hands a lot more and some people don't but you can also tell something about when a person who uses their hands a lot to speak or gestures a lot normally when they speak but they're not in this instance that can be a cue for something or vice versa if somebody normally doesn't gesture a lot and now they're just waving wildly right that can be a cue as to something different about that message as well we also, we also look at touch, what we call haptics, as a nonverbal channel. So different than body movement, we use touch to express different things. And, and there are different types of touch. And again, this is very much culturally bound to, you know, what's appropriate, what's not appropriate, what's usual or what's not usual. Um, so, but touch can be an expression of comfort. Touch can be an expression of affection. Touch can also just be like a care provider. When you go to the doctor and they touch you, um, that's not a, a sign of affection or, or things like that. It's a sign of, you know, it's a, it's a practical touch that they're that they're touching you because they need to in order to diagnose things and in order to check things out. So. Um, we use touch in a variety of different ways to communicate different things. You know, there's also aggressive touch and harsh touch and inappropriate touch. And so um, we communicate in a lot of ways using touch. Now, again, remember, this is very much culturally bound. Some cultures are more touchy than others, right? Um, in other cultures, actually, have compared to the United States, other cultures have uh, touch is a lot more part of their culture. They touch a lot more in the United States. We don't touch a lot except with people with our um, that are that are in kind of our inner circle uh, that we're very very close to so but it can mean different things in different cultures keep that in mind as well we use our voice and sometimes people think you know our voice that's verbal communication no our the language that we use the words that we choose that's verbal communication but the way we express that using our voice is called paralanguage right and that is nonverbal our tone, our volume, the rate of speech, that's all nonverbal in nature. And so our voice communicates a lot uh, along with the verbal aspects of our message. The way we use space, or what we call proxemics, uh, is a nonverbal channel. 
and again, very much culturally bound. In the United States, we tend to have a wider uh, space expectation. That, that idea of the personal bubble or personal space is is wider than it is in other cultures. Other cultures uh, have a much uh, narrower personal space, much smaller personal space. Uh, but you know, so we have this you know that inner, inner circle that's kind of reserved for those who are really you know, your significant other, your children, people like that that are allowed to be very close to you. And then that bubble expands uh, with our expectations here in the United States. But the way we use space can communicate something. You know, somebody who feels comfortable getting closer to us, that communicates something about how they feel about that relationship. Or when somebody's speaking to you and they lean in and then they whisper in their, in your ear, right? So that's using a couple that's using space to indicate, Hey, this is kind of a private thing. And then the tone of their voice and, and the way they're using para language also communicates. This is a secret. This is something I only want you to know. So we're using those nonverbal channels to express. They, they probably don't even have to say, Hey, don't tell this to anybody or don't say this to anybody else. Um, we know that from the way they're using those nonverbal channels, that this is private. This is a secret. So the way we use space and different things like that um, communicates something very significant to us. We have additional nonverbal channels that we use, such as territoriality, the way that we use space and view space around us. When you're in your in your workspace, for example, when you're when you're in the workplace, maybe you have a desk or a cubicle or even just a work area that that's yours, right? And when other people encroach upon that, you get a little territorial about that, right? What are you doing in my workspace? Don't touch my work things. This is my responsibility. And so we communicate that nonverbally by indicating, by, you know, being protective of those things. We can also communicate kind of a lack of uh, acknowledgement of that by encroaching on other people's workspaces. And that can send us a message of power and, uh, and things without even saying a word, right? So again, we're using these channels non-verbally to express things or to express ideas. We use time or chronemics as a nonverbal channel. So, um, you know, in the United States, we're, we're very, we call, uh, monochronic. So we're, we're very much you know, time is a resource, time is money. And, uh, and so we view time in a very strict way. If a meeting is supposed to start at three and end at three 30, then by golly, it better, or people are going to be upset. Right? Or if your class is supposed to start at a particular, particular time and end at a particular time, then the expectation is that we will respect those time frames. Um, in other cultures, it's a little more fluid. And, and we use this non-verbally as well to express, again, things like power, or we, we interpret things like power and respect out of time. So if somebody's late for a meeting, late for an interview, late even just to, you know, your friend's late to pick you up to go out somewhere, that can be seen as a sign of disrespect, or it can be seen as a sign of power. You know, it's okay for the boss to be late for things, but not so much for an employee to be late with a, for a meeting with a boss, right? So it can send a sense of power in that regard as well. So we use chronemics to express things non-verbally and, and also not just to express them, but to, we interpret things from those, you know, if somebody's running late, it sends a signal that they don't respect our time or don't have great regard for our time and so forth. It can be interpreted that way. Physical attractiveness is a non-verbal channel, you know, and this will vary from person to person. And uh, so what people find attractive is subjective, meaning it's individual to that person. Right? Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. But the idea of physical attractiveness is a nonverbal channel. The, the, you know, what we find physically attractive will be a nonverbal communicator for us. And, 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 just, and culturally, what we find attractive, um, in a broader sense will be used nonverbally as well, right? Which is why when companies were trying to sell products, they select uh, models and spokespersons and, and actors and actresses and people that, that they think will be physically seen as physically attractive in a broader sense to sell those things, right? Because they want people to be drawn to that product. So, um, physical attractiveness is a nonverbal communicator. Clothing is a, is a very, important nonverbal communicator, the way that you are dressed. Um, and, and so let's just take it in a broader sense. When you go into the workplace, there's probably a specific way that you're expected to dress, right? If you work in a professional office, then you're probably expected to wear 
you know, business type clothes, right? Maybe a suit and tie, maybe at the very least business casual so that you're, you look like a professional. But if you, if you work in a, a heating and air, um, business and you're a heat, you're an HVAC tech, then you're expected to wear the uniform of that company, right? Maybe a particular shirt, perhaps even pants, or if you work at, even if you work at, at uh, McDonald's or Walmart or those places, they have a uniform, right? So that you can identify employees so your clothing is sending a message of of i work here and so you're dressing appropriately for the workplace in a personal sense you know we wear things that we feel like express who we are as a person so it may be that we wear uh, the, the a shirt or hat or something of, of the particular sports team that we support or a particular band that we really enjoy that sends a message to others that's a nonverbal communicator hey this is what i'm into this is what i enjoy this is what i like doing and and it allows other people who are interested in that to to kind of be drawn to us and allows people who are maybe not interested in that to kind of not gravitate towards us right so or just the particular style of clothes that you're wearing sends that same type of message so clothing is a is a very important nonverbal indicator in terms of communicating who we are and drawing others to us or or maybe saying it sending a message to others that they may not be as interested to in in us so uh, and then a physical environment can be an important um, aspect now this is a little bit different than territoriality territoriality has to do with protecting Kind of your area or identifying what's your area and and making that known to people the physical environment has more to do with how you keep that area so what does your home look like you know how do you decorate your home what kind of home do you have or, or your room if you if you just have a room in that house well how do you keep it how do you decorate it what's that say about you uh, how what's your desk look like at work is it neat and tidy or is it is it totally disheveled um, what's your car look like if i was to take a ride in your car would you have to scoop all the trash off the passenger seat so i could sit down and then put my feet over all that trash or is it neat and tidy and, and what does that say about you what does that communicate about you um, as well as when we look at physical environment we can think about where are you choosing to share this information with me right you know if we're at a really crowded uh, noisy bar or concert or something like that and you're shouting something at me I can probably take from the context of the physical environment that this is not necessarily a secret. This is not, you know, really private personal information, right? As opposed to if we're, if we're just in a, you know, by ourselves in a quiet room somewhere and you express something to me, then, then the, where you chose to share that information sends a message as well. Right? The physical environment in which we're at, uh, where we're at when you choose to express that information. So we need to consider that as a nonverbal channel as well. And then finally, smell. Smell is an important nonverbal channel. Uh, we have tons of, of olfactory sensors, right? And that's why we call this olfactics. It's the, the, the use of smell as a nonverbal channel. Uh, but uh, that we, you know, send off, we know that subconsciously we have pheromones and things like that, but we also just choose to smell a particular way, right? In, in our modern time, we choose to, to shower and use particular soaps with, with these smells. We put on cologne, we do these things. We, we um, do our laundry with a certain scent of detergent. Uh, we choose to, to have, have air freshener things in our house so that it will smell a particular way because we send a, a certain message. You know, or when, when a realtor is showing a house, they may bake some cookies or get some of that fake cookie smell. So it smells like home, right? We use smell as a nonverbal channel uh, quite a bit to, again, kind of attract people or repel people or, or um, any of those types of things, right? So um, we need to be aware of smell as a nonverbal channel. So as you can see, we've got a lot of different nonverbal channels at work here in every situation, including the one you're seeing now. There are lots of different nonverbal channels at work here between what they're wearing their facial expressions are they making eye contact you know what's the, the physical environment in which they're they're interacting and all those different types of things so you got to put them all in the blender and and take them all into account uh, but we need to be aware of that as communicators both in terms of when we're sending messages what are the nonverbal signals that we're sending through all these channels and then as we're trying to interpret those messages from others we need to consider what are all the different nonverbal channels and be more aware of the different nonverbal channels at work. If you have questions about the nonverbal channels or anything related to communication, nonverbal communication or other types of communication, please feel free to email me. I'd be happy to, to communicate with you that way and, and look forward to that. In the meantime, I hope that you will be aware 
of the different nonverbal channels, both as a sender and or as a receiver in communication, um, so that we can more fully um, look at that communication experience and have a much better um, opportunity to correctly interpret things based on the various nonverbal factors.